The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 691 for Sunday, January 7th, 2018. And welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show where you come to Las Vegas and confuse your hosts. <laughs> uh, this is, of course, Mac Geek Gab, and the goal here is that we answer your questions, we solve your problems, we share your tips, we share your cool stuff found so that every single one of us can learn at least five new things each and every time we get together. And one of the things that I'm learning right here in Las Vegas is how to podcast from a different setup because here in Las Vegas, getting ready for CES, I'm Dave Hamilton. And here also in Las Vegas, Nevada, John F. Braun. Sitting right across from me, in fact. And just marveling at the, the, the rat's nest of wires in front of me here. Hey, well, you know, we've got to make this work. Yep. It's um yeah so John and I are sitting in uh in my hotel room here at the Mirage in Las Vegas where we uh, flew in yesterday for CES uh where we're going to be here covering it both for you folks and for our readers at uh at Mac Observer our CES sponsors this year are Elgato, Otherworld Computing and Smile so uh we really thank those folks for doing what they do to make it possible for us to do what we do frankly uh, let's dive right in and see if we can get a little more comfortable, even though we're not in our comfortable setup. So we're going to go to Daniel who has, um, a, a great question. He says, um, I was poking around in disc inventory 10 and I found a hidden folder at the root of my hard drive called volumes inside it. I found quite a few little folders. One of them was called cloned Macintosh HD and it contained, contained uh, an app, Keynote, that was taking up 600 megs. So I deleted it. Um, but I did a little digging on to what the volumes folder is. But why are these other folders in it? And can they safely be deleted or removed? So this is a good question, man. Because the volumes folder is where we see Mac OS exposing its Unix roots. Right? Um, when Unix, any Unix, uh, including Mac OS, when they mount a drive, what they do is they assign it to a folder. I know that sounds a little weird, right? But that's how it works. Um, and so Apple chooses in Mac OS to put all of these folders inside another folder called volumes. Different Unixes do, do it differently. There's um, on Linux, it, it's often slash MNT for mount points. But it could be anywhere. In fact, you know, we've done servers in the past when drives were much slower and, and smaller, where we had like three or four drives in a, a server. And so we'd mount one at, at, at root, which is just slash. Then we'd mount another one at like slash USR so that it could hold all the user data and another one at whatever, you know, slash TMP or slash swap you often used to do. Right. So this is just how Unix is. When it mounts a drive, it puts it in a folder. Mac OS puts them inside the volumes folder. Normally this folder should be pretty clean and should have entries about any mounted drives. Now that includes network drives, disc images, and your boot drive, right? Uh, which is aliased or shortcutted to slash. Um, it will also have an entry depending on which version of Mac OS you're running. It will also have an entry for com.apple.timemachine.local snapshots so that Time Machine can do its thing and put that stuff there. That, that's Those are sort of the interim backups that Time Machine does before it can transfer them over to your, your big Time Machine backup. But anything else that's in there that doesn't match either that or a currently mounted drive is usually the result of a mounting error. Think about this. When it mounts a drive, the first thing it does is it creates, this is when I say it, it's Mac OS, it creates a subfolder inside volumes with the name of your drive. Then it sort of attaches this drive, whatever it is, network drive, physical drive to it. Um, it's possible for that process to be broken though. And only one of those steps to happen. So you, it's possible to have a folder without a drive attached to it. 
And if, say, you were in the middle of a clone and your drive became detached, but your cloning software said where I know to put this is at vol slash volumes slash um, uh, what was your thing called your cloned Macintosh HD, it's going to copy it to that folder. But now it's just a folder. It's not a mount point. So that's what happened to you is this folder just happened to be there without a drive attached to it. And so it just saved it on your local drive as a folder, just like anything else. So you were totally right to clean that out. Um, hopefully that makes sense. I, I've been trying to think about a different analogy to use for this, but I, I mean, I, I think it's, it's pretty straightforward, but uh, it's one of those weird things. What do you think, John? I've seen this before too. And here's the thing that bothers me. I'm looking right now, Dave, in yep. my volumes folder, and I see two things. Macintosh SSD, good, right? <laughs> Just my boot drive, and something called preboot. Preboot, okay. <sighs> oh, it, I don't know about you, but the high Sierra, high Sierra installers, um, I don't think clean up their mess because this is a partition that's created under high Sierra, right? And if you do disu to a list, you'll see it. It's listed there. It's called preboot. Right, right, right. I don't know why it's existing as a folder in my volumes folder, and I have to keep getting rid of it. But the thing is, I keep running because I think I'm trying to solve a problem. And, yeah, uh, and I'll reinstall. Typically, from recovery, I'll, I'll I'll reinstall the OS, and it leaves this mess behind and baffles me. I have this on mine too, <coughs> and I did a clean install. Oh no, I didn't do a clean install of this. Yeah, and I've deleted. Yeah, one's called Preboot, another. Um, huh. That's the only one that I've seen left over. And and when you delete it, it comes back. Well, I think it only comes back if I run the installer again. So it's a, mm. again, my theory with that is that the installer is leaving things behind. Another time that I had something very strange happen and it ended up to be a problem within the volumes folder. So I was doing a, um, a rip with handbrake. Okay. And I wanted to save the result to sure. my Synology and then, you know, use a video station. Right. Um, handbrake a lot of times, when you're running it, if it starts to try to do a rip and then it all of a sudden quits immediately, that's usually a problem. Now, it could have been like I had in the past where the lib DVD CSS, I think is what it's called, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, is expired or not linked properly or something and you have to put that in again. But in this case, what was happening is I saw various folders in my volumes folder. They were folders with a line through them showing that I didn't have access. What I think I had done is use the wrong protocol to mount them and the permissions were wrong. So it was like, oh, you want to save to, you know, the, the uh, video folder on the right, Synology? Right. Well, what you mounted says you can't. So stop it. <laughs> huh. I had that one time. I think I was mounting it with SMB instead of AFP. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Set, right. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Huh. But so that's why I think about that. The only thing is I'd be cautious. Um, in this case, it makes sense, especially that folder folder. You should never see a folder folder. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In yeah, case yeah. That something went wrong. It's just something went wrong. And what can happen um, is, let's say, you know, Dan had this cloned Macintosh HD there and 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 then went to mount his drive called cloned macintosh hd what would happen if you looked in the volumes folder is you'd have the folder and then you'd have cloned macintosh hd one and that would be the mount point for the drive that came in it's just os 10 or sorry mac os doing its job and making sure things don't conflict and crash into each other so it just adds a, a one or a two or a 10 if it has to, if you've got all these folders out there. So it, it would it would maintain the user experience as best it could because you would just see it on your desktop as cloned Macintosh HD and it would work just fine. But um, but yeah, cleaning it up. It's a good thing. So cool. Yeah. Now looking at our chat room here, yeah. which you can always read, reach at MacGeekGab.com slash stream. Uh, I saw a, 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 a Brian Monroe yep. um, pointed to an article on Stacks Exchange. I don't know if I necessarily believe their conclusion. Their conclusion is that it has to be there in order for you to boot APFS. And I can tell you that that's not the case on my machine. So, uh, oh, okay. 
Huh. I mean, the, the person who, an- one of the person people that answered it, they're correct in that the pre-boot volume is a new system partition. But I don't think you should be seeing it in your, vol- in your volumes folder. Yeah, it, that's, uh, is it mounted? Um, uh, how do I? Disu to a list. Thank you. <laughs> you knew the question I was going to ask before. Yeah, because I, I, I just did it. that too. Okay. Oh yeah, so it is that preboot is not just a folder. It it truly is the um it is part of the 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 disk structure, that container. Yeah, I wouldn't delete that, man. I think that's supposed to be there. Yeah, I've deleted it and everything seems to still work. All right. I would leave that one alone. I I mean, hmm. the, you know, I obviously the esteemed Mr. Braun here uh is you know, able to take these risks with this system. I don't know that I would recommend that to anyone willy nilly, but feel free. That's interesting. All right, cool. Let's move on to, uh, to David and see what we get with David here. You have to pardon me because I'm on a very small screen compared to what I normally have. I'm on my 11 inch air, which by the way, this 11 inch air is I, I told you a couple of weeks ago and I published that article about it too. This air has a new lease on life now that I've disabled Apple's tailspin D and spin dump processes. And I'll put a link in the show notes to the instructions for how to do that. I, I mean, it, it's awesome because what would happen before is uh, when a task would start using a lot of CPU, like I'm doing now, right? Cause I've got audio hijack running. I've got the app that plays all our, like our sound files and all that stuff is going on because we're, you know, we're doing a show. We have this, the thing to stream to the chat room and it's fine. But what would happen is tailspin would notice that these apps were using lots of CPU over a period of time. And it would, it would fire up and take sample logs of these processes and that process in and of itself ate up tons of CPU. And uh, and so I just turned them off. Uh, it, it, it's relatively easy. The, the only difficult part is on OS on uh, Sierra and High Sierra and maybe before. I can't remember. But you, you need to turn off system integrity protection to uh, to let it work. But uh, I've done it as far back as El Capitan. And it it's um, it's a great thing. So I'll put a I'll put a link in the show notes about that. And now. Uh, while I was vamping about that, we will move over <laughs> to David and, uh, David says, let me, oh yeah, I'm still going to have to vamp here because it just, I just got to make this file bigger. That's what it is. David will get us there though. David had a support ticket with Synology. Oh, and he was asking us, uh, do we have any thoughts about speeding up the initial time machine backup? to his Synology. He's got a Synology uh, DS 218 plus. So relatively new uh, Synology unit, two bay with a pretty fast chip in it. And uh, he says, you know, doing the initial backup, he had sent a support ticket into Synology to see if he could say connect with USB or something else to do that direct attached as opposed to over the network uh, in order to get that first backup, you know, all that data across. And he says, it seems like it's taking quite a while. Any thoughts or tips are appreciated. Well, um, and Synology told him, no, you can't connect USB to a Synology. That's just not how it works. It's a network attached device. But there well, is a way to well, do. you can. Now, you can't connect a Mac to it USB. You can connect a drive off of it USB. Yes. Right. But but you can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. You can so, connect the USB drive and, copy and transfer data to the Synology. That's true. But you could Synology, do it that way. Yeah. But it doesn't have. A version of Time Machine. Right. In theory, if they could get Time Machine or license it from Apple, then they could execute that. But sure. they don't. So they, they don't. Can't. Right. So while there's no way to back up your Mac connected to your Synology via a USB cable, don't forget about the other wires that you could use because you can do a wired backup over Ethernet. Now, your laptop may or may not have an Ethernet port. You might have to buy like a Thunderbolt to Ethernet adapter or something. Um but gigabit Ethernet is pretty darn fast, right? It's 1,000 megabits per second full duplex, which is much faster than USB 2 at 480 half duplex, although not as fast as, say, USB 3 at 5 or 10,000, right? Um, but chances are that your 
Synology unit doesn't have the internal drive speed to take data much faster than gigabit Ethernet. And uh, and so, you know, it, it's worth remembering that gigabit Ethernet's really fast and it's a wired connection and it can work very, very well. So that that would be my advice to you. That's what I always do. Well, that's not always what I do. Sometimes I just let it happen wirelessly. But uh, you may f- also find that because Time Machine's backing up lots of small files, that even over gigabit Ethernet, or if you do happen to be doing it, you know, USB uh, to something else, obviously not your Synology, because we just talked about that. But uh, you may find that it's not going to go as fast as the interface or even the drive's maximum speeds would allow. It's It's going to be slower because it's doing a lot of different things. So thoughts on that, John? Whenever I have to do a fresh um, time machine backup of my yeah. MacBook Pro, I hook it up to Ethernet instead of wireless. There you go. Well, yeah. one, because this has slower wireless. It's 802N and not AC. But oh, really? Remember, this, is 20, this is the 2012. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There was a company that was offering a module, but they never... It never work. happened. They're still working on it, actually. I went to their webpage, and they were like, uh, coming soon. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I waited like... <laughs> I really? ordered it, and they took my money, and I was waiting for like four months. Was that like, Bear Extender? No. No, no. Oh, no. Oh, okay. no Bear Extender's cool. No, yeah, this yeah, was, yeah. Um, I'll see if I can dig it up. Okay. <laughs> very, very good. All right. Well... Let's see where we go next here. Jason writes in and Jason asks if I can find it, which I can, I think. He says uh, he's been trying to get his contacts to sync. So he has uh, an iPhone, an iPad, I believe an iMac and a MacBook Pro. And contacts sync just fine on everything except his, let's say his MacBook Pro. I, I, I'm paraphrasing as I'm reading the question, but one of his Macs won't sync contacts. So he's tried a few things. He's tried the whole log in and log out of iCloud. That's usually the answer. That yeah. didn't work. I know. And so any of you following along, like that, that is the thing that often fixes this. Uh, but for Jason, it didn't. So um, other things to try would be adding a new contact on the affected iMac, sometimes that can kick it into gear uh, because you're you're telling it to make a change that it has to push to the cloud as opposed to just waiting to pull from the cloud. A lot of times, and I'm oversimplifying here, but it helps to think about the concept. A lot of times with syncing, what'll happen is you, uh, even though you have lots of different records, what you what what each computer has is it maintains a last updated version number, right? And so when something changes, it increments that version number and pushes that to whatever server is syncing these things. So that if, you know, let's say you have version 10 on all your devices and then you, with your iPhone, you make an edit, it makes an edit to one of the contacts or whatever, and then increments that version number from 10 to 11. Now all the other devices check in and say, Hey, have there been any changes? They don't need to look at every contact record. All they need to do is look at that version number and say, Hey, do I have what you think is the latest? And if iCloud says I have version 11 and the the computer says, Oh, I've got version 10. Now it goes through the process, figures out what's new and goes through the change logs and pulls them down. So by adding a contact on your Mac, you are sort of forcing it to increment the version number to something that iCloud might take. And, and that can really often kickstart that process. Um, failing that rebooting in safe mode. And then of course, back into regular mode and, or using Onyx to clear out uh, all your sort of normal caches. Sometimes that can help because iCloud syncing uses a lot of caches to make it more efficient. And sometimes as we know, those caches can get to be a little weird. Um, Going past that, it, you know, if that doesn't work, it, it's worth looking at iCloud in general. Are calendars syncing, right? Is that something that's happening in a reliable way? Um, and, of course, with Jason, he tried all of these things. Calendars are syncing fine, all of that. So now that we're here and I get into the what would I do if it were my computer scenario, the first thing I would do whenever I, whenever I start asking myself that question, the first thing I do is back it up. Because I know I'm going to start trying things 
that are possibly quite destructive. So I would back up my computer, but I would also, for about what we're about to do, make a contact-specific backup on your Mac. So go to Contacts, File, Export, and choose Contacts Archive. Frankly, I would do that from not only the Mac that's having trouble, but from the Mac that's syncing properly, because it's possible that what we're about to do here might blow away things on iCloud, and it'd be nice to have a backup of what was actually good. So do that. Um, and then within Contacts, select all and delete. Um, right? But you got to wipe this out to force it to come back down. Um, I would before, so there's a couple ways to do this, but that that's the core of what we're doing. You could do that while it's live with iCloud. That may or may not push things the right way. This is why we make backups first. The other way to do it is to first turn off iCloud syncing and then delete all the contacts, let it settle in, maybe even reboot. Then when it's all settled in, turn it back on. See if that says, hey, you want me to slurp down everything from iCloud? Yes. Okay. And that might get you there. And in fact, that's it. now that I'm talking it through, I think, John, that's what I would do first is turn off iCloud, delete everything locally, and then turn it all back in, on and, and, uh, and see if it comes back down. Thoughts for, from you, my friend? I think one thing that you didn't mention, but an initial step would be to, yes, the thing we all love doing, turn it off and on again in that just turn off contacts with an iCloud and then turn it back on. Sure. That yeah. Way. Um, of course, the next one is, you know, logging out entirely of iCloud and logging back in. And that, right. as you pointed out, take a while. So, well, and, and, and didn't work for poor Jason in this scenario. So, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, we'll find it. Hey, I'm going to do something here, John. So I apologize if it makes noise with John's mic, but I'm afraid that John's, um, I'm going to call it his mic stand was going to cut his headphone cord. Really, our mic stands, I'll post a picture of this to Twitter. Uh, our mic stands are sitting on top of ice buckets because we needed to get them up higher so that we could talk with you and have the mics close to our faces. So it's a, it's a funny little setup, but the, the rim of the ice bucket was about to uh, potentially put a, put a nice dent in John's headphone cable. So, All right, moving on. Yeah, next up. Uh, okay. okay. I was trying to... Uh, yes? I was trying to find where the data file was located, and I'm not coming up with a, a good answer immediately. Oh, where to go wipe it out on the on your well, hard drive? Just, well, not so much wipe it out, but so you can look at it. Sure. And, like, see the last date on it. Yep. To see... Yeah. I've had to do that in the past. Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, that would be a helpful thing to find. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's application support address book. Is that right? I'll, I'll is it still can, I'll see if I can find something. Stored in uh in address book, is that still the name that we uh that we assign to it? Because I know calendars are in um not yeah, home library calendars. I there is home library no, there isn't. Huh. Huh. Yes. I don't know, man. Yeah, it might be in home library application support address book. I've got I've got quite a few data databases in there. And actually, on my machine, they all look old, like tw dated twenty sixteen. So oh, I really? That's current. Oh, I don't know. On mine, they're they're updated as of last night. Or actually, that may have been from when I did a local copy versus I. Okay. I don't know. Okay. All right. Moving on. Uh, Avram had a question. Hope I'm pronouncing your name right, my friend. Uh, we've emailed a lot, but we've never spoken. Uh, perhaps we should fix that. You might be an interesting person to have on the show sometime. Uh, anyway, Avram writes in. He says, I travel a great deal and use a VPN when I am outside of the USA to stream various video services like HBO. However, some services use location services as well as their IP address or your IP address, my IP address, to determine where you are. Evidently, location service does not use the VPN to decide where your device is. I can understand if one is using a cellular phone, which can use GPS, but I'm using an iPad that doesn't have cellular or GPS. Two questions. 
How does location services know the true physical location and what can I do to get around this? So yeah, this is interesting, right? Because I've experienced this before too. And it does seem like location services happen sort of outside of any VPN connection that might be linking you to somewhere else. Um, and it, I, I don't think location services uses that data at all. Certainly not as its priority. It might use it to do some confirmation, but, uh, but I don't think it does IP address lookups, certainly not as step one. Um, so, and we'll talk about how location services might get your data in a second. One solution though, would be to disable location services entirely. That might serve your purposes. It might also make HBO choke and say, I need location services to work. Um, and if that's the case, I'm not sure there is a workaround. Uh, but yeah, to my knowledge, the way location services works is that it uses either like GPS, but you, you would only have GPS on an iPad if you had a cellular radio. Otherwise, there's no GPS. Those are in the same circuit. Uh, so assuming you don't have GPS, which you don't, location services mainly uses Wi-Fi triangulation, where it looks at not only the Wi-Fi network that you're connected to, but all the networks that it can see around you and looks up the MAC addresses of those routers in a database like potentially skyhookwireless.com. And we'll put a link to that in the show notes. Now, I don't know if Apple uses Skyhook or uses something else, but there are these databases that correlate GPS coordinates with public or not even public, but just uh, Wi-Fi networks that broadcast their SSIDs. So you can just say, even though you're not connected to a Wi-Fi network, that can give a hint as to what your location is, especially if you can see three or four of them. Uh, you can really, you know, com sort of compare them all and say, oh, yeah, they all say they're in the same location. Awesome. That's where we are. Um, if it is Skyhook, and I don't know if it is, but if it is Skyhook, uh, you can go and change what Skyhook has as your GPS location in their, in their database. But beware, it will change back as soon as someone connects to that network and also does it with a device that has GPS like an iPhone, it'll immediately, or maybe not immediately, but eventually update that database. So I'm not convinced that there's an answer here, but it is an interesting thought process to go through. What do you think, John? I think that Apple has a dandy article that huh. lets you understand a bit more about this. So I want to add something to what you said. So. Here's what they say in this article. So the title of the article is Turn Location Services and GPS on or off on your iPhone, app, iPad, or iPod Touch. Okay. But here's the statement that they make to uh, clarify what you said. iOS devices might use Wi-Fi and Bluetooth to determine your location. Oh, Bluetooth. Because when you think about it, Bluetooth has a lot of the same parameters as huh. other protocols. Their MAC addresses. Right. Their IP address. Or maybe not... Uh, typically yeah. people don't do IP with, with Bluetooth, but Bluetooth can certainly do the similar thing is saying like beacons, you know, right, the beacons right. that, they ha that Apple offers. Oh yeah. So location he probably doesn't have a beacon at his house, but certainly, yeah, that's possible. Ah. Yeah. And I remember in the past I, I had actually used uh, at, at one point I was using uh, a program uh, Strava, I think it was to okay. map my bike rides. Yeah. And at first I used my phone, but then I'm like, you know, I wonder if this will work with an iPod Touch. Because the iPod Touch doesn't have GPS. Sure. Or, uh, but it has Wi-Fi. And the thing is, because I have a pretty densely, uh, you know, a lot of Wi-Fi in my neighborhood. Yeah. Um, it worked pretty good. Until there was one point where it couldn't find any Wi-Fi. So it looked and like you jumped, you like teleported from one oh, place I, to I, another? I, I drove through a swamp. Yeah. Or I biked through a swamp. Sure. Because it couldn't get the data so it just extrapolated and it's assume, like oh well, assume I saw you it went here, the shortest distance and i yeah. saw it here huh <laughs> hey, that's pretty cool uh, i like that yeah so i'm not sure there's a magic answer here they they do everything they can so that location services is not uh misled is really what it comes down to it's not apple trying to be nefarious in fact it's apple trying to to make sure that location services is, is accurate regardless of where your internet traffic may or may not route. So, yeah, it's good stuff, man. Good stuff. Where else are we? Let's go to Bill. Let's see what Bill has to say. 
Uh huh. And uh, Bill has to say, where is he? I know. Sorry. I'm usually much faster than this. He said, I may, I think I may have heard of the white screen of death the first time on your show. Lately, he says, it started with the settings app on my iPhone. Choosing it gives a white screen. If I just let it sit, it quits and then usually launches properly the next time. I started having the same problem with the messages app. I have several backups of my iPhone with iMazing, which predate this problem, but I'm not sure what to do. Of course, I have tried restarting my device. Yeah, it. it like, I, I know we talk about this regularly, but restarting your iPhone is definitely something to try when lots of things don't work. I've had it fix Bluetooth problems. I've definitely had it fix Wi-Fi problems. Of course, I've had it fix app problems. But it's just not one of those things we think about doing because we just don't restart our iPhones regularly. And that is sort of the reason that maybe some of these things sort of, you know, cascade and get get foobarred. Um, sometimes if you connect your iPhone to your Mac, uh, sometimes you can see the debug logs in console on your Mac from your iPhone. Uh, that could be handy in telling you what's going on here. It sounds like a RAM issue, though, that the app doesn't have enough resources to load into. And what's happening is it's trying to quit other background apps to free up RAM in time to launch the settings app. And then it sounds like a timeout has happened. But by the time you relaunch the settings app, all those uh, other processes that iOS is, was telling, you know, quit, quit, quit. I need your RAM. Come on, come on, come on. Give it, give it to me. Like that's already happened. And now settings can launch just fine or messages can launch just fine. So the question would be, what do you have running in the background on your phone? And those logs in console uh, or that you can see from console with a USB connected iPhone uh, might give you an indication as to what's running in the background, what's triggering, what's using RAM, what's holding on to RAM. But that that certainly seems like what it is. And it you could uh, another way to troubleshoot this bill would be to take a look at what apps you've installed since those backups where you didn't have this problem. Um, you know, there's a couple ways to get there, but, but really what you got to do is find out what changed. And in this case, most likely what app did you install specifically one that's got permissions and need to run in the background. That's, that's where I go with this, John. I've had this once it was with, <clears throat> or it could just be a random bug. Sure, had, it could totally be a random buck, yes. Well, no, I had it one time. It, it would happen not all the time, yeah. but frequently with Pokemon Go. And it would only happen entering a, a, a battle. Yeah. All of a sudden, I would just get a white screen. I could yeah. click on my home button and dismiss the app and come back. And it was yep. like, oh, okay, now I work. It's like, well, why did this happen? Yeah, just that makes sense, right? Because Pokemon Go is, I mean, games tend to use... Lots of system resources, RAM and CPU and all that stuff. So, I mean, I can see that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Another thing it does is does it typically doesn't work very well if you're on a VPN because they think you're trying to fool them. Oh, yeah. Well, there are all sorts of hacks. Yeah. My son found one of those hacks for Pokemon Go. Uh, I mean, it was a while back. I don't know if it still works where he could put himself anywhere in the world that he wanted to be. Um, and it, I don't know. It seemed to work out OK for him. But I think if they see something unusual, which yeah, like you're teleporting around the world like a maniac. Yeah. Well, if they see you coming from a place that they don't expect you to be coming from, it's like. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. All right. Good, good, good. Well, we hope it uh, we hope it still sounds good. We know uh, we know we recently moved to discord for our remote shows, which is what most of them are. And we get that sounding delicious. But, uh, you know. Different mics, different room, bouncy walls. We did turn off the air conditioning just for you, so you didn't have to hear that hum in the background, though I'm sure there's other hums for you to hear. All right. Uh, let's see where we are here. I, I swear I'm going to find this agenda again, John. There it is. Um, yeah, let's go, to, let's go to Les here. We've had this question actually hanging on for a week or two, and... Uh, and I, I like it because it's uh, it's interesting. It's all about Thunderbolt. He said, I've always liked having my iTunes and photos files on my Mac's internal drive for both speed and reliability of syncing. 
However, the number of, and size of these files is now forcing me to think of external storage. My iMac has, which I believe is the same year as yours, Dave, uh, Thunderbolt 2 ports, uh, which are inside the mini DisplayPort ports. And that is what I have, yeah. He says, if I were to buy a Thunderbolt 2 hard drive or a Drobo or a Synology, uh, would I be able to use it on the new Mac with Thunderbolt 3 ports? I know Thunderbolt 3 ports use the USB-C interface. Could a simple adapter be purchased? And would such an adapter slow transfer rates to USB 3 speeds? Um, so, yes, there is an adapter. Apple sells one. Uh, I think you could probably find them from third parties as well. And it's exactly what you need. Um, that said, you might want to consider the efficacy of buying a Thunderbolt hard disk. Um, there are not a whole lot of single drive enclosures that will benefit from using Thunderbolt over, say, you know, USB three um, because single drive speeds, especially rotationals, which is probably what you're going to do for you know this type of library. It's exactly what I do for this type of library won't even begin to hit those USB three speeds, right? Let alone what Thunderbolt might bring to the table. And the thing is with Thunderbolt, you'll be paying a lot more for an interface in those cases. Like you just, and you're, you're paying for it on both ends. Now you already have a Thunderbolt interface in your Mac, but now you're paying for an adapter to go to Thunderbolt, to go to something that's going to be slower than Thunderbolt anyway. Um, I, I'm, I'm not convinced this makes uh, the right sense. I've used Thunderbolt hard drives. Uh, you know, I have the benefit of, of testing things that I don't have to pay for often. And I, I mean, it works fine. It's a, it's a perfectly good interface, but you're going Thunderbolt to SATA or Thunderbolt to, you know, whatever's in the, in the drive enclosure, but really then you're going from SATA or whatever down to the speed of that particular drive. Now, if you're talking about something like a Drobo, where you've got a direct attached device with multiple drives that are all sort of, you know, raiding together as one. Now Thunderbolt could make sense, right? Because you're, you've got multiple drives and you're taking advantage of the sort of the combined speed of all of them. Definitely worth considering there, but for a single drive or even for like a mirrored drive or a dual drive kind of thing, I, I, I don't, I don't think that Thunderbolt is worth the expense. Obviously if you can get it, without without having to pay for it then it's not gonna it's not gonna be a bad thing um but it's not gonna do just by having just by adding thunderbolt to a drive it's not gonna make your life magically better um and in most cases you won't notice a difference other than the hit to your wallet what do you think mr braun if i'm hearing this right the confusion here is that thunderbolt 2 used a display port type mm -hmm. port whereas as pointed out the Three uses a USB, so yeah. So you sure, need the, uh, yeah, and he would need an adapter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I sort of took it in a different direction, but you're right. Yeah, it's just you know, just using the adapter slow it down. No, not using the adapter, but but what you're connecting to the adapter is sort of where I went with this. Like, yeah, let's 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 reject the premise for a second and just explore that. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't think it's the right thing. Anything else on that, John, before we move on? All right. I still got to join the Thunderbolt Club. Do you not have any devices that support? Your, that computer's got it. The one right here has to support Thunderbolt, no? Um, I've plugged a display adapter into it. It's got to be Thunderbolt. If my 2011 MacBook Air sitting oh, next yeah. to this supports Thunderbolt. Well, hold on. Let me look at my system report. I do have a Thunderbolt. I think I've got a... Yeah, a, here we go. A, Thunderbolt. Yeah. Uh, 10 gigabits times two it says okay so you have two thunderbolt ports on there you look at the other it's not on this side it's on that side no there's one here all right then that's it okay huh. yeah so i don't know if it's two channels or maybe yeah it could be yeah 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 well we'll see this is probably the place to be <laughs> to uh yes that's true to help people evaluate their thunderbolt perfect. that's right yeah <laughs> yeah all right, cool. Um, sure, we'll go to uh, we'll go to Karsten here. Karsten, Karsten had a good uh, a good question this week that's always worth exploring. He says uh, this might be a bigger subject in and of itself and too large, but we'll try anyway. He says with all the buzz surrounding Internet of Things devices, I think that's a uh, relevant conversation to have as CES is about to kick off here. 
Uh, and their firmware vulnerabilities and default passwords never getting changed with IoT devices. He says, I wanted to reach out to see what the GeekGab community's thoughts are on this. There are so many products on the market. So let's focus on the Elgato Eve product line. Uh, he says, here's my concern. Almost all the products support HomeKit and the Android equiv equivalent. And that's where my concern lies. We know that Apple uh, updates their products regularly, which is great and aids in keeping our smart home devices secure. My concern is adding an IoT device, which also supports the Android platform. Since I will be using HomeKit, I will never configure the Android components, which means I will never reset the admin portion. This seems like a problem or vulnerability. Now, he says, one might say, since I do not use the Android portion, I have nothing to fear. Uh, he says, well, just because the Android portion is not in operation, the feature sets there, the doors are open, and the right command could enable and exploit it. So the main goal is to ensure that the dark side, meaning the buggy Android features, cannot be invoked in any way when not configured. He says, I could go the crazy route of getting a separate internet line, separate router, different Apple ID, only connect HomeKit to the new wireless network, etc. That would work, but it's crazy, and I would lose a lot of functionality by doing that. Uh, he says, so what are your thoughts? Should I not be concerned about this? I know of viruses that infect Macs and PCs, uh, which hunt for IoT devices and try to log into them. Uh, he says, I'm really interested. So this is a great question. And I actually wrote a piece back in uh, the end of 2016 about exactly this, because you're right. Apple does a great job securing HomeKit, uh, which really is the connection, really where the security is in that um uh, the focus of the security is, is between your iPhone and the devices. And that's so that nothing can hijack that connection and get personally identifiable information off of your iPhone. And that's great, but you're totally right that most of these, not all, there are some IOT devices. I think Belkin's got a few that are home kit only, but the by and large, because home kits not even close to the most popular IOT standards. I think Amazon's Alexa is, oh, sorry. Amazon's a word is, um, I think that, uh, that, that most of these devices are always going to have the ability to be connected via, you know, uh, Google assistant or, um, you know, so G word, a word, C word, even right. Um, not just S word, which is of course home kit. And you're totally right that all of these other doors are wide open and Apple imposes no restrictions otherwise i've talked with apple about this they uh certainly have their standards for how you work with HomeKit, but there is nothing in their standards that says and thou shalt not employ any you know awful standards also there's nothing in there that says that you are welcome to have anything else so you could secure it all down with HomeKit. And then leave the door wide open with no password whatsoever for somebody to connect via a web browser. And boom, it almost doesn't matter that HomeKit security is there. Almost, I say, because still the connection between your iPhone and that device is still encrypted and secure. So somebody can't do a man in the middle attack there. Um, so, yeah, you're right to be concerned. And and you're right that uh, default passwords aren't going to get changed on this stuff. And there's no magic answer. I mean, I think you need to look at each device. And even though you're not going to use the Android stuff or the web stuff or whatever it is that your device also has, you do need to go in and change those passwords and update that stuff if you want to make sure that it's not vulnerable to those attacks. Right? Yes. <laughs> Thanks, John. I think that they're... <laughs> no, I agree with you. Yeah. Um, and it's because there are you know standards are great because there are so many of them but um <laughs> but the problem is you're always going to run into um developers um probably not on purpose but leaving little back doors or uh and thing things like that and they forget to take them out and then of course you can just log in as root and ruin everything yeah i think part of the hope is that a lot of these network overseers if you will like eros um product. yes things that uh, and even um i think they have a new version here we're going to check them out but uh the box device that, that i looked at advertised this feature but it didn't do it in the way that i expected but it said it would tell you if right. there were 
bad pa- passwords that either didn't exist or were were not that great. Yep. You yeah, told me, I think it was the, you have the Eero Plus thing. I did, I have not enabled that. Okay, what product were you using? Because you, you had Fing. one where... I was using the Fing box. Oh, the Fing box, okay. And that does some of this. So what we're talking about is devices that sit on your network. And it, this could be your router, as John was pointing out, or something else, like the Fing box, that sits there and looks for some level of nefarious activity and warns you when it sees it which is which is the really the right way to do this because you can't you can't expect every device vendor to do it right you need if you want a hundred percent well you're never going to get it but if you want something approaching a hundred percent you need something on your network and it could simply be you being very diligent or with the help of a device like we're talking about here that monitors what's going on in your network and tells you when it sees something that's like, huh, this doesn't look right. You should look into that. So, yeah. And like you've seen, like, for example, the one day that you were running it and Pete came over, it said, hey, guess who logged into your network because you had given him access. Right. And some of us have seen mysterious devices appear on our network, whether it's. Well, I don't know why that happens sometimes, but uh, it Do could you see be. stuff appear that shouldn't be there. <sighs> Once, hmm. once or twice, and I'm not sure if it's because I had guest access on or something. Oh like, yeah, for sure. Yeah, what I saw it was either a printer or a device, and it was like that's not mine. Whoa. Well, when I tried to connect to it, it said it failed. So it could have been something that fleeting. Uh, I don't know. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still, that's kind of scary. Yeah, I mean, it hasn't happened in a long time. So that's good. It could have been again that I had some guest access on, and uh, right and. And someone stumbled across it and then I disabled it. Yep. 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 Yeah. It's good. It, it is good to have something that the thing box doesn't do it all. Um, but it certainly makes it easy for the things that it does. And for me, it does enough that um, it, it's, I really find that thing box a very good balance between knowing what I need to know and not pestering me all the time so that I, I I have not learned to ignore its warnings. When the thing box tells me something, I look at it. Now, for the first day or two that you have the thing, uh, it's a little overwhelming because it's telling you about every device that's that that's new to it, which is, of course, everything initially. And it is worth going through all that. It, it pays and it doesn't take you very long. But then after that, like the other day, yesterday, I got off the plane and I got a notification that Nathan's iPhone had joined my network at home. I, I assume that that's my kid's friend, uh, Nathan. And so I texted and asked him like, Hey, Nathan was over. They're like, yeah, that was Nate. I'm like, oh, okay, gotcha. Great. No problem. All good. But I have had things like, you know, just appear and it's like, um, what is that? Or it also warns me about when a device opens a UPnP port on my router which is really nice. That's where it, like the danger can happen is when devices start opening things to the outside world without your knowledge. And this, this is a really nice way to, to be alerted to that. So it's good. It's good. All right, man. Uh, you want to take us to Zach or Kent, John, do you have a preference? Uh, let me get to the page here. Yeah. So I know we got to vamp a little bit as we find our way around with our, well, Smaller screens. screens. Yep. (laughs) I should really, I should be using my iPad pro as a second screen here. I just didn't think to do that until really, until we started doing the show. And I was like, yeah. Okay. So are you ready? um, Yeah. I think Zach is a a good short and sweet one, but it's a a good question. So here we go. Hey guys, my church just got a new Synology NAS DS218 plus. Oh, okay. It's the second time we've mentioned that one in the show. All right. We that's have a popular a, one. Actually, that's a really good one for mm-hmm. a small starter. Yeah. And we have a Lissi too big network two drive, which is a NAS. Just to right. be clear. Lissi makes uh under that name they make both NAS and direct connected uh devices. So I checked this one out. Okay. We are trying to transfer files from the Lissi to the Synology and was wondering what the best way is. We have files that contain periods. I know, right? <laughs> Good old DOS days. Well, no, you, you can do that on Mac I know. As well. well, all of our files contain periods. Most of yeah. them do. Yeah. 
And using FTP seems to jack things up. Also, is there an easy way to bulk remove a character out of a file name? In previous FTP uploads, the period got changed to a question mark contained in a box, which I think is the uh, mystery character. Right, the universal mystery character, Uh yes. (laughs) All right, so here's the answer, though. Um, And I've actually done this, Dave. I'm just going to, sorry, I'm just going to aim your mic down so that you don't have to crane your neck, man. Oh, and and your mic's going to fall. (laughs) Sorry about that. Don't touch my mic. Okay. All right. <laughs> so the thing is, with the, like many features on the Synology, it may not be worded quite the way you'd expect it to be, or just buried somewhere. And this is a feature that is buried somewhere. So what you can do with the Synology is you can connect to a shared folder on uh, another NAS. So, for example, what I do is that I have the, um, the two-bay Synology, running DSM, of course. Of course. And then I have a Drobo. Okay. Uh, which supports both SMB and uh, AFP connections. Um, here's what you can do on when you're in File Station, which is uh, Synology's Files Manager. If you go to File Station, Tools, Mount Remote Folder, SIFS Shared Folder. What is SIF? Well, SIFS is Common Internet File System, which I think is another name for SMB in the Windows Protocol. Okay. So it's kind of weird that they name it that because I don't think many... I think only people that have been around computers for a while even even understand, even have even heard of SIFS. I don't think anybody refers to it as that. If anything, you refer to it as SMB. But okay, oh, I didn't even I didn't realize that that was, huh? Okay, all right. That's or I've seen it know. called that at times. Yeah, but, yeah, um, yeah. Otherwise, yeah, and then I think they have another choice. I think NFS is the other one. Again, kind of an obscure right. one. That Network file like. system or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what you do is then you in the dialogue you enter the path to uh, your shared folder. Something like backslash backslash 172.16.1.100 slash my stuff. The username, the password, and then what folder, so this is very similar to the volumes folder. You say what folder on the Synology you'd like to map it to, and then once it's done, voila, it appears. Ah. Then what you can do, or what I, at least I did, so every now and then I'll do a full backup of what's in my Drobo. Yep. You just copy that newly attached folder and then paste it somewhere else on the Synology. And it'll go through the it'll go through the entire operation of copying everything from that remote folder to the Synology. Takes a while. Huh. <laughs> huh. I don't know if you've ever tried that, but that's how you do it. Okay. There are a few other ways you could map drives and all that, but yeah. that's the one that I just came across that did what I needed. It. That's pretty simple, too. Wow. Yeah. Huh. That's pretty good. Yeah. The only disappointment is that it only offers SIFs and NFS. That's kind of weird. I don't know why they um, Right. But like you said, SIFs is essentially SMB, or mm-hmm. in it, at least in the way Synology implements it, it, it works that way. So, okay. Yeah. Just would be nice if they had like AFP or something. That sure. Right. Yeah. Well. Yeah. All right. Um, as for the second question, if you got file names with weird characters in them, uh, I can suggest that you look at something um, that's called a better finder rename. Yeah. Trying to do some of this from the terminal can get kind of squirrely and, or, or from the finder, especially if it's a, a wide ranging problem. Right. Like, you know, bogus characters and all of the file names. Right. I think it'd be really difficult to craft that with like a move command or, or a rename command. Sure. Well, yep. it's move, right? In Unix, it's move. MV. MV. Yep. Yeah. So yep. you say, yep. you know, MV, this to that. And, yeah. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'd give them, I'd give them a try. And they're at um, uh, huh. www.publicspace.net slash a better finder rename. All right, so, cool. We'll so I think you could probably list. go through that and say, hey, get rid of all the, you know, these uh, c- crazy question mark characters. <laughs> Yeah. Because that can confuse, I think it may confuse some file systems. It, yeah. And it's worth, it, it's worth remembering that Mac OS may support a character set that is larger than your NAS supports. And a lot of them, especially with their SMB or, you know, if you're still using AFS um, implementations, will try and map those characters. But you can wind up with exactly this scenario where even though your Mac knows what that character is, 
there's no way to save it on your NAS because your NAS is not using HFS plus or APFS. It's using, you know, whatever it has like EXT4 or maybe BTRFS or who knows. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So just be aware of that. Maybe try not to use, and I know this is an awful thing to say, especially, you know, if you've got like gigabytes worth of, of files, but try not to use overly special characters. And, and you're right, John, a better finder ne- rename is the way to go with that. Ah, that's good. You want to take us to Kent, man? Yeah, Kent's got one from the ages here. Um, hi, guys, and Happy New Year. Thank you. Just a quick one. Tried not to bother you with this, but after a Google look up, couldn't seem to find a real answer, and I don't enjoy being caught. Ever since I've up to High Sierra, I keep getting this pop-up on my startup on the desktop. Um, and by this, um, it's Java SE 6. Okay. Which he said in the subject here. I thought he would do a screenshot, but he, he mentioned in the subject. Sure. Line. So we've got Java 6, which if you don't know, Java 6 is not the latest. There's right. Java 7, and now the current, as far, the, from what I could find, is Java 8. Yep. So, but there um, are some things that still require Java 6, which is why it's still available. Yeah, somebody told me, I think, Creative Cloud or some Adobe product okay. seemed to require it. Yep. Yeah, I seem to remember running something that needed java 6 so two things so so i surfed around here and the thing is so apple at one point did offer their version of java or mac specific sure java 6 installer that you could get from them um you could also get it from oracle who now owns uh java right right but um so here's the thing i found that with the apple stuff the place that you want to look. So there are two places that I suggest that our friend looks, and then I have some additional information. So the two places to look, Dave, I would say are, if installed by Apple, the, the information I found is that it's in system, library, Java, Java virtual machines. Okay. If it's installed by Oracle, then it should be in library, Java, Java virtual machines. Then you'll find the various pieces of Java in there. So you could go to either one of those and whack it, and that should get rid of the Java virtual machine. So that's interesting. So it's basically the same location. One is inside the system folder. One is just the library folder. Um, and that's how you decide whether it's been Apple that put it there or some third party. Mm-hmm. Huh. Uh, the other thing is that you probably have a Java preference pane, and so you probably want to get rid of that as well. And for pretty much any preference pane, yeah. if you right-click on it, you'll get an option, remove Java preference pane, or whatever preference oh, pane it is. Sweet. Um, then uh, Oracle had an article, which uh, I'll, I'll point to this one as well, and it took a slightly different path. But I thought I'd mention it because, number one, I mean, well, they're making the recommendation and they do Java. Right, so, right. So they, they suggested a few other places. Um, I haven't actually tried removing it because I, I still like want to it. run Java. Yeah, right. Well, I don't have the Apple version. I wasn't willing to uh, install the Java 6. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't want to create this Java mess of these two, of all these different versions of Java right. flying around. Right, right. Um, but yeah, I have their article too, and so I'll link to that. Okay. The, um, cool. Yeah, which is called How Do I Uninstall Java on My Mac? So I, I will link to that. And between those two, uh, I think you can get rid of that because I, I've seen a lot of people get pestered with that, which keep saying, hey, you know, you got to gotta update Java. It's right. Like, oh. Right, right. There we go. Cool. Hey, I do, uh, I want to take a minute and thank uh, really, I would like to thank everyone that's contributed this week to our Mac Geekab premium uh, program, which you can find out about by going to either just MacGeekab.com or more directly to MacGeekab.com slash premium. This is uh, something we set up years ago uh, in response to so many of you that that wanted to reach out and support what we do here directly. Uh, it has made a huge difference. Uh, I don't want to say that the show wouldn't exist without it, but it might be fair to say that the show wouldn't exist without it. So I, I, so I'll say it. Um, I also said, I would like to thank everybody that has contributed this week. I can't, um, I can thank some of you, but I prepped this show before I left for Vegas. And most of these records, uh, at least in the way that, uh, 
I I work with them are only on my home Mac. I mean, they're backed up. Don't worry about any of that. They're, of course, on our, our web server in, in a secure way and all of that stuff. But in the way that I pull them and make sure that I'm properly acknowledging every one of you, uh, that's all done on my my iMac in the office. And so there there have been many more of you that I'm about to thank here because when I prepped this on, I think it was Friday, so many things came in uh, over the day, Friday and then and then yesterday. And, you know, I want you each to know that I have both uh, PayPal and Stripe are the are the ways that that we process uh, your payments for these things. And I have them both now uh, buzzing my phone and watch when payments come in. So when when that happens, I get the, the little happy, friendly reminder that uh, that you folks are out there doing what you do. And it, it's actually a great thing to to have throughout the day. So thank you. Um, and I know that lots of these came in, but I do want to thank the ones that I have proper logs for here. And then, of course, we'll catch up with the rest of you next week. No one's lost um, on the biannual plan, which is twenty five bucks a year. Uh, sorry, twenty five bucks every six months. By default, we have Norton B. We have Michael P. We have Tony G and John O. Thank you very much. We also have Putch on the biannual plan at $50 because you can set your amount to whatever you'd like it to be. So thank you so much. Uh, on the monthly $10 plan, the only one that I have on my list is Abdullah B. Thank you very, very much. And then a one-time contribution of 100 bucks from Karsten. Thank you, my friend. Thank you all. Thanks to everybody that I didn't yet mention. Like I said, we'll definitely catch you next week. Um, I just want to make sure I do it right and don't miss anybody. I've only got like half the records here or I mean, I actually have all of them here, but only in, in like half the way and I can't mark them properly. So again, thank you so much. It means so much to John and I that um, that you do what you do so that we can continue to do what we do. And thanks. All right. Um, you want to talk a little bit about Spectre, John, and Meltdown? I kind of do. A lot has been said about it. And thankfully, on Thursday, Apple said something about it. And Apple put together a pretty good uh, one pager to explain not only what these things are in general, but also what they have done and are doing to um, to to mitigate against this. So these two things are attacks that could target features in modern CPUs. Um, both of them are centered around speculative processing, uh, spe specifically Spectre. In fact, that's where its name comes from. Um, what that means is that your CPU guesses at what work it thinks it should do next. Um, it looks at where your code is going to go and how your program is written. And then it goes and says, all right, I think the next thing that might be asked for is this and then this and then this. And if it, if it's correct, well, then things just got a lot faster because the work's already done by the time it's asked for. If it's not correct. Okay. Well, no big deal. We did some work. We throw out the result. We'll do the next piece of work. Um, so that's, that's at the core of this. Um, there are two attacks that Spectre can do. One is, is, is specifically this, and they call it the branch predictor. Um, unfortunately, with that, uh, the, the fix is updating CPU architecture to turn off the branch predictor or turn off certain features of it. And some CPUs can actually be modified with a, what effectively is a, a firmware update or a microcode update. Uh, presumably, this is because the engineers of those CPUs have put in the ability to disable the branch predictor for their own testing. Uh, I can only assume that that would be the reason that that's there. So so that can be turned off, but but not as easily. Um Another one is for Spectre, and this is, I think, what Apple will be fixing in Safari coming up, is that it is attacking the array bounds, which means that um, a program can look beyond the memory that it is built to have if other programs are being... Um, 
too quick about storing their data in memory before they sort of reserve it. And, and this is, again, common practice. Uh, and I'm trying to, to, to simplify all this down, but this is common practice to just make your code more efficient. Uh, if you don't put the box around your data before you put your data out there, other software could be looking at what that what's in those memory locations. And so the fix is to <laughs> my mic stand didn't work, John, the fix and this is what Apple I think is doing with Safari is rewriting those bits of code to say, no, no, like go and reserve the memory and wait until you hear back from the operating system that the memory has been truly reserved and then go put data out there. So what they're calling this is serializing that as opposed to parallelizing that. So it's happening one after the other, as opposed to potentially one next to the other. So that's Siri, that's Spectre, sorry. And Apple is updating Safari to protect against that. And then um, Meltdown is an attack that's based on the way operating systems share memory between user programs and the operating system itself, or what, what's called the kernel. Uh, the kernel should be reserved and no one should be able to see it. But the problem is the CPU, of course, can see both things. It has to be able to. That's how it works. Um, operating systems, though, can be patched to keep this from happening with potentially a minor performance hit. Apple has already updated all current versions of, of Mac OS and iOS and tvOS. Watch OS isn't affected. Uh, for this meltdown thing, but they say that there's no performance hit in any of their testing um, and they're going to keep testing it. So we'll see anything to add to that, John. This is some, you know, it's aggravating. That this is so common after all these years, but I think um, at least one of the attacks, the generic name for it is a buffer overflow attack. Mm. And it, as you explain in more detail, um, if you blow past and I actually did this in, in some early days of C programming. Yeah. You can tell earlier versions of C, I think they've, they fixed this, but you could say, hey, can you uh, put something in location 15 of this 10 byte array? And it's like, sure. Oh. Some compilers will warn you. It's like, well, why are you trying to go past the ends of this buffer? Right. And they even have products that'll look for this sort of problem or detect when, because uh, the problem is, is that the data, it, you can interpret, if you know how to do the attack, you can interpret the data rather than data as instructions to execute. And that's, now I don't know why things were architected that way. Yeah. But it seems it's pretty common is that these, you know, one area of memory that's meant for data storage is next to the part of memory that has the code that you're running. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. Yeah, it's fascinating, man. It's um, yeah. but I like the branch prediction thing too. I mean, it's almost taking it, it. It's almost like looking into the future. Yeah. Well, I guess yeah. The processor is making guesses. It's like okay, well, one of these four things could happen. Um, but I don't know enough yet to make it make it so. Right. But at some point, it's like oh yeah, okay, that was the right guess. So let's get rid of all these others. So let's so, yeah, let's get rid of all these others. Yeah. 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 It's pretty. It's pretty fascinating. Um, how all this goes. I think the general advice, though, is that I heard from, uh, you know, especially a lot of people were complaining that certain outlets would be focused. That they were saying that this was only an Apple problem. And the thing is, it's a problem for Intel, ARM, and I think uh, multiple processors, just yeah. because a lot of the, the way you architect a processor it, is... Th yeah, this is, this is the kind of thing that's going to ripple back through the curriculums at universities for microprocessor design and uh and and just software engineering in a general sense i mean there's they, you know we've we've gotten we've we've started taking advantage of so many of these these um efficiency features that you know somebody finally stopped and thought hey hey wait a minute could this be used to attack and read it really what what the problem is is in theory someone could read data in memory 
that does not belong to their mm-hmm. process. I mean, that that's the core of the problem. And and we've talked about sort of the details of it, but that's it. That's that's what this is. Um, Apple's patching Safari because it's possible that a website like like if, if you if you don't install software from nefarious or questionable, I don't want to say nefarious, but questionable sources. Like if you're only installing things from either vendors that you truly know and trust or the Mac app store or the, you know, of course the iOS app store, then your chances of having an app that's going to do this are pretty slim, not impossible, but slim on web pages though, where, JavaScript can run and start doing a lot of these types of things. It's possible that without installing any extra software, just by visiting a site, things could start poking in and maybe stumbling into the area of RAM that's holding your password manager's data. And maybe it's going to grab something unencrypted at that point, because who knows how that's, I mean, at some point, your password manager needs to decrypt that data to populate a field. So where is that holding in RAM and can something access it? So that's why Apple's patching Safari for this. Um, I know I'm oversimplifying, but I, th- I think I think we're getting the gist of it. So I just wanted to go through that. Hey, man, we had um, we had a, a few follow ups from the last episode. The first one I wanted to talk about was my what I thought was my network loop. Uh, remember, we like the show had to stop in its tracks. Uh, so what I, the way I fixed it temporarily was I disconnected the ethernet cable that runs between the house and the office. The router is in the office. I was recording in, in the office, essentially I was in the studio above it. So that just disconnected the house. And immediately, as I mentioned, that dealt with the problem. So everything like came back online. There was obviously some, you know, packet storm happening on the network and it was definitely sourced at my house. So I disconnected the house. Everything was fine. I assumed it was a network loop and it may well have been an hour and a half later. We finished the show. I decided it was time to troubleshoot. I plugged the house back in and everything's been fine ever since I made no other changes. So what I think, as I mentioned, I put a new switch in place too. I think, um, switches, have something called an ARP cache, ARP cache that remembers where, which port on the switch to go out to get to a certain device or whatever. And it just makes things more efficient. Um, The problem is when you start changing things about your network, that ARP cache might well be wrong. Uh, What I should have done when I installed my new switch, because I have many switches throughout the network is I should have powered down every switch that I have and force them all to come up from scratch and, and sort of relook at the network that way. I did not. I just plugged this new switch in, in place of an old one. And I'm thinking that may have been part of my issue, Uh, but that problem's gone. So I just wanted to follow up because several of you were asking and uh, I, I wish I had a magic answer, but perhaps that's it. So there you go. Any thoughts on that before we uh, go into the other follow-ups? I like ARP. ARP is good. I remember, and, and what you'll see, if you want to see ARP in action, get a packet sniffer like Wireshark, and what you're going to see are messages where it's going to say, okay, the type of message is ARP, and it's going to be a message of the format. Who has this IP address? Could you please tell this other IP address, which I suspect is the router? What you can do, and I, I remember doing this in a security challenge long ago, you could do something called ARP spoofing. spoofing where you can forge the response to this, because typically a lot of these protocols don't have any sort of security. No security, right. So what happens is somebody on the network asks this question. The person who should answer answers, but then you send an answer with different information. And we actually... Oh, interesting. That makes sense. Yeah. And we actually did this. So this was def, you know, this was proof of concept, I guess. Sure. But we sure. convinced someone who was a client to come to a different machine to retrieve a web page. Because we sent enough packets to it saying, no, 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 you want to go Go, go this way, go this way. Trust us, go this way. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, yeah. I had to do that in a hotel room once. I think I talked about this where uh, there was a machine with a virus that, that was just constantly taking over the network. And so I used ARP to blast it off the network. And then, and then, I, and then I put my machine as the IP address of, that that one had 
so that when it tried to come back on the network, it would stop. I knew it was a Windows machine just from from the data that I saw from it. And uh, I knew that it would just stop in its tracks with an error message up on the screen. So, yeah, ARP can be fun. So I think that was my problem last week. Um, we talked about, we talked with, uh, I think it was with Michael, where we were talking about uh, power issues and uh, USB power issues uh, specifically. He had those anchor um USB hubs that were powering his hard drives or connecting his hard drives, I should say. And his Mac was occasionally throwing messages that said no power or not enough power. And we walked through a lot of that. He tested both of these anchor hubs with his iPhone. And it's very interesting. It's got uh, one of them is their 10 port hub. It's got seven USB three ports and then three, what they call power IQ charging only ports. And it plugs into the wall. Here's the interesting thing, John. He plugged his iPhone in to one of the USB 3 ports and disconnected the hub from his Mac. So it wasn't going to sync with his Mac, but the hub was still plugged into power. His iPhone did not charge. His iPhone would only charge if A, he plugged it into one of the Power IQ charging only ports, or B, he plugged it into the USB 3 port and connected the hub to the Mac. So those seven USB 3 ports are getting bus power from the Mac. They're not providing their own power. I never would have assumed that, but he, I mean, he tested it and confirmed it. I'm going to ask anchor about it this week here. Cause that seems weird to me. Like why wouldn't the hub be provide? There might be a very good, like a USB related reason why they don't, mm -hmm. but that was really weird. I mean, you're adding seven hub, seven ports to USB. You'd think you might want to get involved in adding some power help to it. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, thought that was interesting. Uh, moving on from that, uh, Brian. Oh, yeah. We talked about uh, Brian not being able to connect to anything but his home Wi-Fi network. And uh, and in the show, I, uh, I suggested that maybe it was a profile that was causing this problem and told him to go into settings profiles, I think, or setting maybe settings general profiles, if I remember correctly. Uh, well, it turned out that helped. He found the Tunnel Bear VPN profile in there, and a recent update to Tunnel Bear gave the option to automatically run the VPN on any Wi-Fi network unless you select it as trusted. And he said on his iPhone, that option is on, and his home network, the one that worked, is trusted. On the iPad, that option is off. He says he turned it off on his phone and now he can connect to any Wi-Fi network as before. So he submitted a support request to TunnelBear to kind of work with them and see if there would be a solution to this problem. So it's pretty good, Brian. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the follow up. We always, always appreciate that. Uh, one last one, I think, from Paul, also about Wi-Fi, uh, although we know what what Brian's specific issue was. Paul had something to add uh, for anybody else that might be going through this. He said, um, he has an iPad that won't connect had he reset network settings. He told it to forget all the networks. Uh, he had a profile, but, uh, but that didn't solve it either. Um, and he said, uh, the only way he can get, uh, on hotel Wi-Fi is to be using a, a, oh, oh, he can't get it to connect to his my fi but he can get it to connect to everything else. And he doesn't have any other, you know, Wi-Fi settings out there. So I, I think even though he's done the reset of network settings, I think there's something more in the network settings that's not getting reset. I would I would try disabling that profile from your company, though, because I that really can get in the way, as we've seen. So very interesting. Any thoughts on that before we move on from Paul, John? Nope. OK. <laughs> Um, I think I'm going to look at the time, but I think it is unfortunately, John time for us to, uh, to start moving on from our, our day here. I do have one cool stuff found to add though. And that comes from listener, Kevin, uh, Kevin writes, he says, I frequently have to transfer large files, long distances over a flaky corporate network. And in order to verify that the files arrive intact, I generate hash values, specifically SHA-256. 
before I send it and after the transfer. It says I used to do this using a terminal incantation involving OpenSSL, but I recently found a free open source GUI app called QuickHash that will generate and compare many different types of hash values. It's available for Mac OS, Windows, and Linux. He said, I wish I had found this long ago. It saved me a lot of time and typing, and it makes sure that after a very large file transfer, I don't get caught. So that's pretty cool. Um, this used to happen all the time in the modem transfer days. You would get uh, a CRC, a cyclic redundancy check, right? I think that's right. Mm-hmm. That would, uh, the server would send that to you and your computer would do it because there would be line noise and all kinds of things that could corrupt a transfer without you knowing any other way. And, and what this does is this just does a calculation on this file that comes up with what should be a unique number, uh, or, or series of numbers and characters that should be the same on both end. You run the same calculation on the same file. It comes up with the same number, but if you run the same calculation on a different file, uh, because the file got corrupted in the transfer, then the number's different. You know it doesn't match. You got to resend the transfer. So that's pretty cool, Kevin. Thanks for that. That's a good, cool stuff found. And with that, I think it truly is time to uh, see if I can bring the band in out of the not quite as cold, but uh, I think I found them. There they are, John. Somewhere. I don't know where they are. That's uh, that's what we got for today. You got anything to add uh, before we before we start diving into the outro here, my friend? Just one thing. What's that? Feedback at MacGeekab.com. Feedback at MacGeekab.com, John? You Are heard you me. sure about that? Feedback at MacGeekab.com. Ah, what about the premium listeners, though? They get a special one. That's premium at MacGeekab.com. And we really appreciate it. We do prioritize the stuff that comes in there. You can also call us, 224-888-GEEK, which, John, is 4335. As far as you know. And also visit us on our Facebook group. Visit uh, MacGeekGab.com slash Facebook. That'll redirect you to exactly the right place. And uh, and that's where uh, that's where you go. If I can find the right app here, I will move us to the outro. There we go. I think I'm doing it. I think it's happening. I don't know why it's so quiet. I'm going to crank it up a little bit. It feels quiet still. I don't know. All right. Well, I'm going to say this. Thanks to Cashfly, C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y.com. Thanks to our CES sponsors, Smile, Elgato, Otherworld Computing. And, of course, thanks to uh, Bare Bones, Eero, all the folks that sponsor us here at Mac Geek all the time. John, you started us down this mess. I want you to end it. Do you have anything to add or perhaps reiterate that we went through uh, throughout the show? Oh, I think I do. And it's especially appropriate since we're in Las Vegas. And the answer to your question, Dave, is don't get caught. Made up.